I encourage you to take your Bibles as we look to the Word of God this morning and look at Genesis chapter 4. Genesis chapter 4, we're going to go through 10 verses this morning. Some of you haven't been around here very often, uh, or maybe this is your first time. We started this back in January, uh, working our way through the book of Genesis. We are all the way in September to chapter 4, so that kind of gives you some idea of the pace that we've been setting. I, I was telling my Wednesday night crew, we're not going to take quite the same deliberate pace uh, as we keep going here. We should start to undertake bigger chunks uh, as we've gotten out of some of the things that are really important in the first three chapters, not just creation, but the establishment of what sin is, the consequences of it, our need to demonstrate faith. But even here, as we see this narrative, this story of Cain and Abel, this very familiar story to many people, even those who aren't particularly Bible scholars, would recognize the idea of sibling rivalry that kind of takes root uh, here in the passage, and that's the name of the message this morning. And as you're thinking through that, we have, of course, we're going to talk about sibling rivalry. What better way to do that than to have a few dad jokes? <laughs> All right, so there's a woman who gets into an accident. She's expecting twins, but she gets into an accident. She, she's in a coma, and she's taken to the hospital, and while she's in the hospital under the coma, she delivers the babies. And so she wakes up, and she's asking the doctor, where are my children? And the doctor says, well, you know, everybody's safe, but you've been out of commission for a while, so your brother came in, and he named the, the children. And she's like, oh, no, my brother, he, he's not very competent. I, I'm, I'm a little concerned about this. Well, what did, he, what did he name the girl? He says, well, she named her Denise. I said, well, that's not so bad, but what about my son? She says, well, he named him Denephew. <laughs> this was seen on Twitter. You ate all the cookies, the parent says, and your sister got none. What does that tell you? The son says, well, it tells me I won. <laughs> all right. So another parent says to their child, do you want this? And the child says, no. Okay, I'll give it to your brother. Suddenly, no, I want this. <laughs> There's that kind of sibling rivalry that takes place with young people. Mom always said that she didn't have a favorite child, which was tough because I didn't have any brothers and sisters. <laughs> And then, um, the, I think the only girl that I know that has said, hasn't said, you're like a brother to me, is my sister. <laughs> and then finally, that moment when your sister and her husband come over to your place for a visit, but really it's because there's a Pokemon in your living room. <laughs> so that's where we are, folks. But that kind of unveils some of the sentiment that we can often have in family relationships. People are related, so yeah have to get along, but in reality, that's not always what we have. We don't always have family harmony. We don't always have warm fuzzies with each other. Now, it's great when we do, but there are times where we find ourselves in conflict with each other, or maybe, if not outright conflict, the unspoken, you know, I'm just going to tolerate their persons because I have to. It's out of duty more than love. There's an opposition in the way that people think about each other. They understand that there's competing ideas, competing priorities, and that's certainly what plays out here between Cain and Abel, as we're going to see with violent consequences. But let's look at the passage here, and we'll start to talk through this together. Uh, Genesis chapter 4, reading the first 10 verses. Again, I'm reading from the English Standard Version. Hear the Word of God. And Moses writes, Now Adam knew his, Eve his wife, and she conceived and bore Cain, saying, I have gotten a man with the help of the Lord. And again she bore his brother Abel. Now Abel was a keeper of sheep, and Cain a worker of the ground. In the course of time, Cain brought to the Lord an offering of the fruit of the ground. And Abel also brought of the firstborn of his flock and of their fat portions. And the Lord had regard for Abel and his offering, but for Cain and his offering he had no regard. So Cain was very angry, and his face fell. The Lord said to Cain, Why are you angry, and why has your face fallen? If you do well, will you not be accepted? And if you do not do well, 
Sin is crouching at the door. Its desire is contrary to you, but you must rule over it. Cain spoke to Abel his brother, and when they were in the field, Cain rose up against his brother Abel and killed him. Then the Lord said to Cain, Where is Abel your brother? He said, I do not know. Am I my brother's keeper? And the Lord said, What have you done? The voice of your brother's blood is crying to me from the ground. This is the word of God, inerrant, infallible, inspired, written by God and written for us that we might know what to believe, that we might know how to live, and then on its pages we might meet the living Christ. May God add his blessing to the reading of his word this morning. There's an outline on the back of your worship guide if you'd like to use that to follow along uh, with where we're going this morning. I want to remind you, first of all, that how God is portrayed in this passage is faithful. He is consistent. He is a God who is compassionate and kind. Yes, we're going to see some of those things playing out too, but that's a consistency of how he has dealt with humanity. God is faithful. You begin to see it unfolding in the very first verses of this chapter as Adam and Eve have their first son. In verse 1, it says that Adam knew his wife Eve and she conceived. She bore Cain and what does she say? I have gotten a man with the help of the Lord. She is, what that little phrase is revealing is that Eve sees this as a fulfillment of the promises that God made to her even as he is delivering the curse, the consequences for their sins. And we're talking Adam, Eve, and even the serpent there. And so you look at the previous chapter in chapter 3 and verse 23, and what we see there is that there is this sense of not only the promise being fulfilled, but there is a task that is being connected with Cain. What is he going to do? Uh, And so in verse 23 of chapter 3, it says, Therefore the Lord sent him out from the Garden of Eden to work the ground for which he was taken. What that reveals to us is that's a task that wasn't given to them from the beginning. That was a task that resulted from the curse. Before this, what were they called to do? You look in chapter 1 and verse 28. It says, God blessed them. This is again before sin, before they've been cast out of the garden. And God said to them, be fruitful and multiply, fill the earth, subdue it, have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the birds of the heavens and over every living thing that moves on the earth. That is that they were told right from the beginning, you're going to have authority. You're going to have responsibility. These things are going to be for you to take care of, to be resources for you to draw upon. They are there as a gift. They are there as a purpose fulfilling for you. But We go back to this idea of what Eve is expecting. They have these responsibilities, one given to them before the curse, one given to them after the curse, but she is expecting deliverance. She is expecting what we read about in chapter 3 and verse 15 when God says to the serpent, I will put enmity between you and the woman, between your offspring and her offspring. He shall bruise your head and you shall bruise his heel. And this is important for us to understand. The next verse talks about how she's going to bear children. We have to remember this. We don't know how long they've been here on the earth, probably long enough to start to see some of the animals reproducing. But to this stage, they have not brought children into the world. God tells them in verse 16, uh, I'm going to multiply your pain in childbearing. So they're anticipating something's going to happen. But Eve is not focused so much on the pain as she is the promise. The promise that one of your descendants, one of your children, is going to deliver you, is going to liberate you from the curse that is currently upon you and all your descendants. So this is crucial. This is important for us to say. When she says, I have gotten a man with the help of the Lord, 
God had made the first man, she is saying, with God's help, I have made another man. One who is going to give hope for the future. This is faith. This is anticipation. We, if we want to know what faith's anticipation looks like, we have experienced some of those things ourselves. When faith, we're going to even talk about Hebrews 11 again this morning, faith acts, faith responds, faith demonstrates itself. A well-known hymn that we often sing around here even is called Faith's Review and Expectation. And you probably know it by another name, the first two words of the hymn. Amazing grace, how sweet the sound, writes John Newton, that saved a wretch like me. I once was lost, but now am found, was blind, but now I see. T'was grace that taught my heart to fear, and grace my fears relieved. How precious did that grace appear, the hour I first believed. Through many dangers, toils, and snares I have already come. Tis grace has brought me safe thus far, and grace will lead me home. The Lord has promised good to me. His word my hope secures. He will my shield and portion be as long as life endures. Yes, when this heart and flesh shall fail and mortal life shall cease, I shall possess within the veil a life of joy and peace. The earth shall soon dissolve like snow, the sun forbear to shine, but God who called me here below will be forever mine. That's Newton's original text, but the title that he chose for it was Faith's Review, Faith's Expectation. What did he anticipate was going to happen because he believed God? Now, did everything always work out for Newton? Did he always... Um, have confidence? No. He says, grace is relieving my fears. I need God's grace. I need it continually because I go through these inconsistencies. Not everything goes the way that I would dictate it, but this is important for us. He understands that through the dangers and toils and snares that he experiences, God has not deserted him. God's promises remain faithful. Now, what does that have to do with Eve's expectations? She's expecting God's going to deliver because she's been able to reproduce. She's brought another human being into the world. And as we're going to see, there's going to be many, many others coming after that. We're going to ask the question, where did Cain get his wife uh, in, a, in a future message? And that's because Eve doesn't just have Cain. She doesn't just have Abel. There's a lot of kids coming through here in the process of things. But God is going to hold true to his promise. You are going to have offspring, and one of them in the future, maybe not Cain like you were anticipating, but one of them is going to be the deliverer that I promised. And Eve had faith that God was going to hold true to that. What we understand next in this is that there is an expectation for God to be faithful to his promises, God is going to accept our worship. He wants us to give him focus. He wants us to put our minds, our hearts, and demonstrate that in our actions and how we live and how we give him what is due. And so, when we see here, how are they to worship God? We don't know exactly how that God communicated to them that it would be appropriate to give a sacrifice. We kind of take it for granted. You know, there in the Old Testament, that's how you, you worship God was by sacrificing things. But there was no law at this point in time. There was no book they could consult. They're trying to feel things out. So somehow, maybe some way, God indicated to them that this would be appropriate. Maybe they reflected back to the time where God had to kill the animals so that they could have the skins to wear for their first clothing, different things. They understood the idea of, of a sacrifice being made, whether it was literal or figurative. But it tells us here in the passage that in verse 3, in the course of time, Cain brought to the Lord an offering of the fruit of the ground. Verse 4, and Abel also brought of the firstborn of his flock and of their fat portions. And the Lord had regard for Abel and his offering, but for Cain and his offering, he had no regard. 
The question, and I don't know if some of you might have wrestled with this. I remember hearing this when I was a young child in Sunday school. And the things that we go to often is, well, the reason that Cain's sacrifice wasn't taken was because it wasn't a blood sacrifice. Anybody hear that? Right? Probably been taught that. Some of you may have even taught that. Okay? Does the passage say that? That's something we, sh- we, should, we should think through. What we see here is that God was accepting of one, but not the other. And what we have to ask ourselves is why? Well, one of the arguments we can make is, does God ever accept any other sacrifices in the Old Testament? Is, is, it, always a, is, a, is it always an animal? Well, look to Genesis chapter 35. I had several pages. Genesis chapter 35. And here we have the story of Jacob. He is on the run. This is, a, this is the passage where he's on the run from his brother, and he has wrestled with the angel. Uh, he's going through some different things, and God gives him a name. And what we see in verse 14 as well, let's pick back up to verse 10. God blesses him, and God says to him, your name is Jacob. No longer shall your name be called Jacob, but Israel shall be your name. So he called his name Israel, and God said to him, I am God Almighty. Be fruitful and multiply. A nation and a company of nations shall come to you, and kings shall come from your own body. And then he goes on. God gives him the promises of land. God gives him the promises that Jacob can hold on to. And so how does Jacob respond? Verse 14. And Jacob set up a pillar in the place where he had spoken with him, where Jacob had spoken with God, a pillar of stone. He poured out, what? Not blood, not an animal. What does he pour out? A drink offering on it and poured oil on it. And so Jacob called upon the name of the, pla- of where, of the place where God had spoken with him, Bethel, that is in the Hebrew, the house of God. So that's important for us to understand. God accepts Jacob's offering, not an animal. You see that again, uh, the similar principle in Exodus chapter 29. Let's turn there if you have a Bible. Exodus chapter 29. And here in this passage, they're talking about the priests and the, the function of the priests offering sacrifices. In, Ac- in Exodus 29, uh, you see in verse 29, it's talking about what Aaron and the other priests are going to wear. It's telling them in verse 31 how they're going to take the animals. So animals are part of the sacrifice. But in verse 40, and with the first lamb, so you're offering an animal sacrifice, what else do you offer on the altar? A tenth measure of fine flour mingled with a fourth of a hen of beaten oil and a fourth of a hen of wine for a drink offering. So, what you have there is offering a lamb, yes, but then you're also pouring out a drink offering, just like Jacob in Genesis chapter 35, and you have the flour, you have the oil, which is a form of bread that would have been baked and given. So, God is accepting not only animal sacrifices, God is accepting the fruit of the vine, as it were, the fruit of the field, there is an opportunity, there is precedent for God to be accepting some of these things. You could see it again if you wanted to look in greater detail at Numbers 15. I won't ask you to turn there, but you can scan that chapter later on if you want to see and establish what's going on uh, in God's expectations for what constitutes a legitimate offering. These are things that God himself establishes with Israel. Now, What does it go, if we go back to our passage in Genesis chapter 4, what does it say about Abel's sacrifice in verse 4? Abel brought of the firstborn of his flock and of their fat portions. And so, that's important to tell us about the quality of what Abel brings. And this is consistent with principles, again, we see later on in the Old Testament. Exodus 13 and verse 2, God says this, this is the kind of animal I want consecrate to me all the firstborn. Whatever is the first to open the womb among the people of Israel, both of man and beast, is mine. 
And then verse 12 of the same chapter, You shall set apart to the Lord all that first opens the womb. All the firstborn of your animals that are males shall be the Lord's. So God puts a value on the prime, on the prominent firstborn. This principle plays out even more, and you start to see the fat portions compared in Luke 20, or not Luke, Leviticus chapter 22, starting in verse 17. And we'll read all the way to verse 25. If you want to listen, you can, or if you want to find the passage as I read, Leviticus 22, beginning in verse 17. And the Lord spoke to Moses, saying, Speak to Aaron and his sons and all the people of Israel, and say to them, when any of the house of one of the house of Israel or of the sojourners in Israel presents a burnt offering as his offering for any of their vows or free will offerings that they offer to the Lord, if it is to be accepted for you, it shall be a male without blemish. 